Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today. So as you're all aware, today's, uh, today's session is going to be on our top tips for successful recruitment. My name's Sophie. I'm one of the HR advisors at Code. So thank you ever so much for joining us today. Today's session is uh, number three in our series of 10 webinars. So just, to, just as a bit of an introduction, we're going to have a look at our aims and objectives from today's session. Today's aim is to increase our understanding of the recruitment process and help managers recruit in line with the relevant legislation. Our objectives to meet this aim is to discuss an overview of our employee rights relating to the recruitment process. We're also going to highlight the risks of not carrying out those all important pre-employment checks. And we're going to explore how the Code Total HR Service can provide you with useful policies and template letters to help practices to comply with your legal obligations. So a few learning outcomes from today's session. We are going to have a look at how we can avoid potentially costly mistakes when recruiting for new team members. We're going to improve our understanding of those pre-employment checks required. And we're going to have a look and understand us the statutory employment rights, rights sorry, relating to the recruitment process. Cool. So our key topics today to enable us to meet those objectives. Firstly, we're going to have a look at the Equality Act. I know a lot of you will already be aware of the Equality Act and, and how that applies to team members but we're going to have a look at how it applies to your recruitment. We're also going to take a look at the recruitment process. We're going to break that down into to sort of manageable steps for you and give you some hints and, hints and tips along the way. We're also going to have a look at those all important pre-employment checks and what that consists of and how you can use our staff file checklist. And we're going to have a look at why it's important to seek advice at every stage if you're unsure. So as I just mentioned, the Equality Act is, is one of the first things we're really going to focus on today. So the Equality Act is, it came into a force in um, October 2010, and it's there to provide us with protection from unfair treatment, and it's also there to promote a fair and equal society. The Equality Act has actually made it unlawful for employers to discriminate against candidates during that recruitment process. The, the types of discrimination that we're looking at throughout this uh, recruitment process is related to those nine protected characteristics. So a few of those characteristics could be a disability, be that a physical disability or a mental disability. It can also be pregnancy and maternity discrimination. It could also be age discrimination, which again is, is very relevant to the recruitment process. Um, also religion based on your religion or your, your race as well. Now, who has the right to claim discrimination? Well, as you, um, I'm sure you're all already aware, your employees have the right to claim discrimination, but your candidates will also have that right as well. So regardless of whether they are successful in this recruitment process, they will still have that right to claim uh, a, a discrimination case against you. Compensation awards for discrimination cases are actually uncapped. So unfortunately, there is no limit on the, the sort of financial um, awards that could be awarded to that, that claimant. We'll have a look at some case law as well. So a really relevant piece of, of case law to the recruitment process is unfortunately a, a business. A, um, it was a few years ago now, but they actually advertised for a sales team. They, in their advert wording, um, unfortunately put that they needed team members um, and candidates to apply with youthful enthusiasm. Now, the word youthful is key here because that's what was used as evidence as a, an age discrimination claim. That, that, uh, that business was actually um, had to award the candidate £70,000 in compensation, which I know is a, a massive sort of financial impact on the business, but it's also had a real detriment to the, the reputation as well. So just a, an example of this, I actually Googled this company uh, just this week and four out of those five top search results on Google were actually relating to the age discrimination claim rather than what that business did um, or how I could contact them. So it's just really key to remember that it will not only have a financial impact, but it's also going to have a really detrimental impact on your reputation. 
So you wouldn't want your patients to be, you know, to be finding out or, or Googling your practice and then see all these sort of discrimination claims coming up in, in their search results. So it's just something to, to keep in mind. So as I said, today we're going to have a look at that recruitment process with you. We're going to break it down um, into to different stages for you to enable it to be to be sort of more bite sized for you. So we'll take you through all the different stages, which sort of starts off with analysing your job requirements and finishes with those pre-employment checks. Now, it's really important to have a, a robust recruitment process uh, that you're working towards in the practice. This is going to help you um, to comply with your Schedule 3 requirements. It's also going to help you to be able to demonstrate that you're complying with the Equality Act. So it's really important to, to have one in place and to follow it to the T. The first real building blocks for your recruitment process is going to be to have a robust recruitment policy in place. Not only do we want to have it in place though, we want to ensure that it's, you know, it's fit for purpose for the practice and that it's reviewed on a regular basis and this will help you to comply with Schedule 3 of your Health and Social Care Act. Having a recruitment policy in place is also going to reduce your risk of discrimination claims because in this policy you're going to say how you're an equal opportunities employer you're going to tell your, your candidates and your internal team members how you select, um, you know, what criteria they're going to be sort of shortlisted on and just be really open and transparent during that process. And all of that will help towards your Schedule 3 requirements and help you to comply with that Equality Act. It's really important that any team members that are going to help you in this recruitment process are aware of your recruitment policy. So they're aware of their obligations and they're, they're, they understand the policy and what's required of them. So the, the next uh, slide we're going to... Oh, sorry about this. Bear with me a second. So the next stage that we're going to have a look at, after we've got your, your really robust recruitment policy in place, the next step, uh, sorry, step is to plan your recruitment. So we need to understand the requirements um, of the role, firstly. So I try not to think about it as a negative. If you have a team member who has left the, the practice, it's a really positive opportunity to take a step back and have a look at what's required from that role. Things may have evolved over time, and actually you may identify some skills gaps within the practice that you could look at filling. Also have a look at what hours and, and days that that candidate is going to need to, to work towards to be able to deliver on that role. Planning your recruitment is going to help you to avoid those costly mistakes further down the line. So if you plan your recruitment and you're really sure of what your role requirements are, you're going to be attracting the right candidates with the right skills, with the right sort of abilities to, to be able to work in the practice and to, to you know, to, to help you with the with delivering on that role. Costly mistakes could be if you hire the wrong person. Maybe it's a, a snap judgment that you think, actually, you know, this team member has left. We automatically need to replace it with somebody exactly the same. You then go through that process and find out during the probation period, actually, we're, we're not sure. We, we think we may need something slightly different. Then you're going to have to start that process again. That's going to cost you a lot of time energy and so it could be costly as well if you've already paid for those DBS checks um, or maybe you've incurred agency fees here as well. So it's really key to have a look and, and to sort of plan your recruitment before you go ahead and, and advertise your role. Another reason to be planning your recruitment is to help you to comply with Regulation 18. So Regulation 18, in short, you need to have a sufficient number of suitably qualified, competent and skilled team members to ensure that you can deliver on patients' needs. So planning your recruitment and taking that step back to analyse what you really need from the role is going to help you to comply with this regulation. The next step after we understand what we really need from that role is to create our, our job description and our person specification. A job description, um, we have job descriptions on iComply that you can download, sort of adopt and adapt to fit with the practice. But in short, a job description should really include what the requirements from that role, which you will have already identified from that planning stage, so you're just formalising them. So it's the key tasks and responsibilities, 
the purpose of that job role is a really good idea to have in there as well. And as I said, there's uh, you know, templates available on iComply that you can adopt here as well. We'll also have a look at a person specification. So a person specification is slightly different to a job description and it's something that's quite often overlooked. Um, I understand that you know, it's quite a really busy environment in a practice, but I think it's good to put the time towards uh, creating a person specification for a job role. It's gonna help you down the line with not only your, your job advert, but also your selection criteria. And having these two in place to ensure that you're consistent all the way through that recruitment process is gonna help you to comply with the Equality Act. So in your person specification, we want to be having a look at the, the attributes that that team member needs. So we want to know what kind of knowledge that, that team member should have, if there are any uh, particular skills or abilities that they should hold, and also if there are any qualifications you need them to have. It might be nice as well to have things running through the job description to this person specification. And by that, I mean your job description, for example, a practice manager, you may need them to help with your compliance. Whereas in the person specification, you can really uh, get a bit more granular and you could say, maybe we need um, 12 months experience with, with dealing with the iComply software, for example. So it's a really key place to get down on paper all of the job requirements and all of those attributes that you're going to look at as your selection criteria further down the line. Now we've got our, our sort of building blocks uh, in place. So we've got our job description and our person specification. That's gonna enable us and help us to be able to write a, a job advert. So what should we include in a, a job advert? As a starting point, we can use the job description to help us with the role requirements. So we want to attract the, the right candidates with the right skills and abilities, and also somebody who's gonna fit in with the practice as well. So we want to say what those key um, tasks and responsibilities are for that team member. It's also a really good idea here, if you can, to document what those hours may be and what days it, it could potentially be. This is gonna help you further down the line, um, just in case that team member may request time off during the day, for example. So we actually had a, an example of this, a practice called a couple of weeks ago to say that they had um, just offered the role to a, a new candidate. That candidate had come back to say, actually, would like to accept. However, could you, could you have a look at me having some time off during the day because I want to observe my religion by taking time out of the day to pray? That, um, that practice was able to, to respond to that in, in the most appropriate way because throughout their job role, um, so throughout the job advert, sorry, or throughout the job description, throughout your selection criteria, um, all the way down to that, that offer, they had made it very clear that that role um, was a, a nine to five role and that they needed to be in the practice and available during those times. That would also go for childcare as well. So if you offer to a candidate and you've already made it very clear that that role is between certain hours, then you'll be able to respond to that appropriately. I would also recommend having the benefits um, in the job advert. So that would be your salary banding if, if, if appropriate. Also any financial benefits you may, may entice them with. So if you offer a bonus scheme or maybe enhanced holiday or enhanced sickness um, pay, that would be brilliant. But it's not only financial benefits you need to pop in here. It can be, you know, you're trying to sell the practice. The job market is, is quite difficult at the moment um, and there's a lot of competition out there. So you want to sell your, so you want to sell the practice and, and the environment. So maybe how about sort of come and join our, our friendly and approachable team. Um, anything along those lines would, would really help you to sell the practice. Because we want to, ident we want to, to sort of um, entice the best candidates to apply. We also need to, to let that candidate know how they can apply to work at the practice. So as a, a basis, we would need a CV from them and we would also need them to complete a, um, a practice application form. As an extra layer, and if it's uh, appropriate for the, for the job role, so I'm thinking for your reception team members, your practice managers maybe, your business managers, you could ask them to, to provide a cover letter as part of their application as well. A cover letter really helps you to be able to, to identify their letter writing skills. And if that's gonna become a big part of their role, then why not ask them to, to do that? And you can um, make your selection criteria from that as well. So that will help you down the line. 
Also, please be aware of the Equality Act at this stage. As I've already mentioned, that job advert wording for that business that, that was unfortunately had to pay the, the £70,000 to the candidate, it was youthful enthusiasm that was used as evidence during that court case. So please be aware of the wording that you're using and how that could be implied um, for a candidate who's reading that job application. So we want to avoid um, you know, male or female stereotypes here as well as age um, and obviously race. If you're in any doubt at all um, over the, the advert wording, it's really important to seek advice because you don't want to, to get it wrong and have to unpick that. So now we've got our job advert together, we're going to be having a look at those advertising channels. Now we do get quite a lot of calls on the helpline um, asking our advice on where we should advertise our roles. Our, the, the main tip I can give to you really is to do your research. So don't be afraid of researching your competitors and where they're posting their job adverts. Have a look on Google. Also a, a really good tip is to search as if you were the candidate looking for the job role you're advertising. So see what comes up top in your, your Google searches. That's the type of places you're going to be wanting to, to place your job adverts. They're the most popular places, so therefore they're going to get the most candidates um, sort of visiting that site. You could also look at um, newspapers if you wanted to as well. And uh, another really good one would be your practice website. Now that could be a, a free piece of advertising, um, so it's, it's one definitely worth looking into. Word of mouth is also a really, really popular way of advertising um, job roles. So tell your team that you're advertising. Tell any of your friends or, or any of your contacts within the industry because you never know who, who they may know um, and who's looking for their next move. Just an important thing with regards to online job boards. So some of the online job boards will screen your adverts for you. So some may, may sort of chuck that advert back to you and say, actually, there's something discriminatory in here. Um, please, can you check it? Whereas, obviously, if you're going newspaper or if you're going for your own practice website, that's not going to happen. So it's even more crucial that you're aware of the Equality Act and how the, that wording can come across to the candidates. Now that we've hopefully um, got some really good candidates applying, we're going to have a look at that shortlisting process. A shortlisting process, I believe, is a really key part of the recruitment procedure. It, it's there really to, to help you to, to sort of shortlist those candidates and take it from a, a really wide selection pool down to a smaller selection pool that you can go on to, to telephone interview. It's important here that you're using a really fair and consistent criteria. So using your job description and using your person specification are going to be ideal for this shortlisting process. Have a look at their CVs, have a look at their applications, have a look at the um, covering letters if you've asked for those. L you'll want to be looking for consistencies, you know, spelling, um, spelling mistakes, grammar mistakes. They may seem like small mistakes, but to me, I would be really thinking, you know, are they committed to, you know, are they serious about this job role? Because they haven't obviously double checked their, their applications. It's also important with regards to the Equality Act again, that you are following that fair and consistent criteria. Because if challenged, you could um, you can provide evidence to say, look, we've, um, we've scored them all on the same criteria, therefore we are acting in a fair and consistent manner. I would also recommend that whoever's doing the shortlisting in the practice has a has um, an understanding of the Equality Act and what they need to do to comply, but that they also understand the recruitment policy. So they've read that policy and they understand um, what they need to do. I've got GDPR on here as well for you. So any data that you gather as part of this recruitment process is going to be personal data. So it's crucial that we are storing it in the correct way that it is um, stored confidentially and that only the right people are, are having access to it. So it's not for the whole practice to have a look at the, the job applications or the CVs, it's just for your shortlisting team. Please also um, make sure that you're keeping it for the recommended retention time. Code recommend that we keep um, documents relating to the, the recruitment process for unsuccessful candidates for a minimum of 12 months. 
Now we're moving on to our telephone interviews. So we've shortlisted our candidates and we've now hopefully got a smaller pool of candidates who we're going to take on to that next, next stage. Telephone interviews are a really great way of understanding a bit more about that candidate and sort of judging their suitability for the role. They're a really efficient way of doing so as well because they don't need to take up too much of your time. In fact, we would recommend about 15 minutes as a maximum here. We also have telephone interview questions um, and notes on iComply that you can download and, and adapt to suit with your, the circumstances. And it's just a really quick and easy way of getting to know a bit more about that team member. You may think they're a, a great candidate on paper. After you've done that telephone interview, they may not come across uh, you know, quite as well. Again, the Equality Act, whoever's doing your telephone interviews, make sure they're aware of the Equality Act and understand that the, the line of questioning needs to, be, needs to be as neutral as possible and that we're following the same set of criteria. Also, with regards to GDPR, I know I've already mentioned it, but your, your interview notes need to be kept secure and confidential and retained for the, the recommended period there as well. Now we're moving on to the, the formal interviews. So preparation is really key here. So not only are you, you are trying to, to address and get the suitability for that candidate, you're also selling yourself. So you want to come across in the best way possible. And by preparing for this, I think you'll, you'll go away towards doing so. So ensure that you've got everything printed that you need. You've got your CV, the application forms, perhaps cover letters if appropriate. You've also seen the interview notes from the telephone interview and you've had a look at that shortlisting criteria. If you can, it's a good idea to have two team members um, doing the, the shortlisting process. I know that's going to be quite difficult and it's quite a big ask in a, in a smaller practice. Um, best practice would be to have the two. If it is just one that you can manage, then just ensure that they are really aware of the Equality Act and what their obligations are. Um, interview techniques. So I would always recommend um, the, the interview technique of um, questions that are going to get the most from your candidates. So you're looking at competency based questions here. So it's questions that are going to avoid those yes and no answers. So we really want your, your candidates to, to be talking approximately 70% of the time as a rough, uh, rough guide for you there. Asking competency based questions such as tell me about a time where your communication skills really had a positive impact on a situation is going to get a lot more from your candidate rather than just asking them, do you have good communication skills? Those are the types of questions you're just going to get that yes and no answer. I would also just let you know not to be worried about any, any silences during this interview. That candidate needs a, needs a few minutes to, to have a think about how they're going to respond. So try not to, to jump in and answer that question for them. Allow them that time to have a think and get back to you with a measured answer. As I've already mentioned, the Equality Act is key the right the way through this process because you are exposed to risk at each stage. So ensure that the, your um, interviewers are aware of the Equality Act, they understand what their obligations are and that they're avoiding questions that could be potentially deemed as discriminatory. By those, I mean questions, for example, do you have children? Are you married? Um, do you observe a religion? Those sort of questions could definitely be, uh, it could definitely imply that you may be discriminating against them. And also GDPR again. So we want to ensure that we're keeping those interview notes really secure, um, confidential, that only the, the relevant people in the team are looking at these notes um, and that they're retained for the, the recommended period as well. Now we're coming on to the really, really exciting stages, I think. So making your job offer. When you're making the job offer, I would always recommend that you do it um, over the phone, first of all. So it just it gives it more of a personal touch. Um, and you can also gauge the candidate's response. So are they excited to join the practice? Maybe they've got a few um, questions that they want to ask you, or maybe they need time to, to have a think about um, the offer before they accept. After you've made that verbal offer, 
I would always recommend following up in writing to that candidate. And please try and remember, it's really crucial actually to remember that you are making conditional job offers. So when I say conditional, I mean that they are subject to certain criteria being satisfied. So that could be subject to two satisfactory references. It could be um, subject to your pre-employment checks. Um, so just, it's really key that you get that in there on both the verbal and written offer. If you're in the situation where you've unfortunately gone ahead and made an unconditional job offer, you are gonna find it very hard to, to withdraw if you need to. Now, hopefully you wouldn't ever be in the position where you need to withdraw a job offer, but we do get a lot of calls on the helpline asking if they can withdraw the offer, what the risk would be there. And the first question we always ask is, was that job offer con um, conditional? So was it subject to your references and, and satisfactory checks? If it is subject to those, then it is gonna be slightly easier. You are gonna have the option to withdraw that offer on that basis, um, but there is gonna be a risk there. So please, please get advice before withdrawing any kind of offer, be it conditional or, um, or unconditional. So now we're looking, so we've made the job offer to our successful candidate. Now we're looking at going back to our unsuccessful candidates. Now, legally, we don't have to go back to them, um, but I think it's a really it's a really good thing to do for the reputation of the practice. So we want to ensure that we're giving those candidates um, the information they need. We don't want them holding on for, for weeks on end, wondering if they'd got that role or not. And it's also really nice if you can provide some, some helpful feedback to them as well. We do have... Um, templates on iComply that you can download to help you make both the job offer and to respond to unsuccessful candidates. So please don't hesitate to, to have a look on there if you need anything. Now I know this slide can seem quite daunting um, but these are just a few of the, the documents that we've got on iComply that can help you with this um, offer acceptance stage. Now these are the types of documents that you're going to be sending out after that team member has um, confirmed their offer um, is accepted. Firstly, you wanna be looking at your, your questionnaires. So your, your confidential medical questionnaire, supplementary questionnaire and information sheet. We'll also be giving them a copy of their job description. So obviously you've already made it easier for yourself because you've done the job description at the, the first stage in the recruitment process. There are also lots of key policies that they need to have a look at ideally signed to agree to before they join the practice and some information as well on their, if applicable, on how they can apply for their DBS. Before the, the team member joins, I would always recommend that you issue them with a copy of their, their terms and conditions of employment. Now, we get a lot of calls on the helpline from practices saying that they, they haven't done so yet because the team member hasn't passed probation. Now please, please don't do this. So. The, the terms and conditions of employment that we have on iComply, they already include your, your probation period there. So it has a probation period clause where it's obviously subject to them um, complying and you know having a successful probation period that, that they then will be confirmed as a permanent team member. By law, we need to give those team members a, a contract within the first eight weeks of them joining the practice. So please ensure that you're, you're getting those out as soon as possible. So now we're coming on to our pre-employment checks. So to comply with Schedule 3 of that Health and Social Care Act, we need to ensure recruitment checks are recorded and evidence is documented. So that's a, a really key thing that we need to, to do these pre-employment checks for, as well as ensuring that we've got safe and, and secure team members. From um, code research that we have carried out, we've, um, we've actually come to the conclusion that a breach in standards regarding the recruitment process or team member documentation is amongst the top three reasons that practices fail their um, CQC inspections. It's a really um, it's a really quick win. So we have put together on the back of that research um, a staff file checklist for you. This checklist is really going to help you to um, organise your staff files and your personnel files. I would recommend having this at the front of each one of your your staff files. It's a tick list for you, really, where you can ensure you've got the right to work in the UK. You've got a CV with written evidence for gaps in employment as well. That's really key there. You've got two references on file. 
you've got your interview notes, and if appropriate, your GDC registrations, indemnity insurance and immunisation records. We do actually have version 2 that has been released in the last couple of weeks, so I would really recommend that you pop onto iComply, download the latest version just to ensure that you're still complying with your staff file checklist and those pre-employment checks. So we have um, quite a few documents that can help you when I comply. So here is a list of our, our key policies and templates that are really going to support you through the recruitment process. The recruitment workflow, that was actually released this year um, and it's a really, really good document that can talk you through the whole way through your recruitment um, process. It goes over a lot of what we've talked about today as well as, as, well as having references to all the different templates that we have on iComply that is going to help you through the process. We have a template recruitment and selection policy. So I would encourage you to, to have a look at that one, adopt and adapt it to fit with the practice and review it on a regular basis. As I've already mentioned, we've got that staff file checklist. So version two has been released very recently. So please do pop on and have a look at that one. And also, just as a, a bit of a side note, we've got the record retention document. So to ensure that you're complying with GDPR, have a look at our records retention to ensure that your personnel files and your recruitment documents are all being retained for those recommended timescales. A couple of actions for next week. I would really encourage you to review your recruitment policy. So have a look at the one that we have on iComply. Um, I would encourage you to adopt the one we have on iComply and adapt it to, to fit with the practice. But also it's key that you're reviewing this regularly as well to comply. I'd recommend that you familiarise yourself with the recruitment workflow. As I said, that's been released just this year. Um, so please do have a look at that one um, and familiarise with yourselves with those stages. I would also um, encourage you to review your recruitment folders and personnel files just to ensure that you're not holding anything that you, you don't need to um, and that you're in line with GDPR. And also, as I've already mentioned, please have a look at the, the latest staff file checklist to ensure that you're complying there as well. So in summary, we've had a look at that Equality Act today and how that really applies to each stage of your recruitment process. So how it applies to your, your advert wording is really key how it's applying to your job description, person specification, right the way through your selection criteria and even down to that job offer. We also um, had a look at the recruitment process. We've broken it down stage by stage for you to ensure that you know what to expect at each stage. We've had a look at that all important staff file checklist and why you, it's really key to, to get a good understanding of, of what the CQC are gonna look for if you are um, having an inspection you know, we had a, a, an occasion recently where one of our members um, had notification that the CQC were coming to inspect. Um, they used our staff file checklist and as a result, you know, that went towards them than being able to, to pass that inspection. And we had some really good feedback on it as well. And we've also had a look at why it's really important to seek advice at each stage, because as I'm sure you're, you're aware, you know, your, your, your team members are your, your biggest asset, but they're also your biggest risk. That's kind of why the, um, so Code have developed a total HR and employment law service for you. So um, as part of this, this additional service, you would have access to your own Code HR advisor. So you would be specified a, a certain advisor and have unlimited access. They would help you take on your cases um, be it small or little, maybe just working out holiday entitlement, or it could be getting involved in and supporting you with a disciplinary process or a grievance process. We would help with those bespoke letters that you need there as well. We'll also provide you with a, a web application. You can use this application to manage your staff absence and store documents. So if you wanted to, you could go completely paperless with your HR function. We'll also have a look and support you um, with your team member contracts, both your employed and self-employed team members there, um, just to ensure that you're staying up to date and complying. If you are interested in this service at all, then please give our professional services team a call and they'll be able to provide you with a bespoke quote. 
And just to, to make you aware, really, we've got a few up and coming events that the team are really excited about. So we've got the induction and probation webinar that's coming up in two weeks time and that will be presented by myself. So that's going to take you right from the, you know, we've already gone through the recruitment process today. So that will be taking us through to the next stage, which is induction and probation. We've also got a HR and employment law seminar coming up in London on the 9th of November. Um, on the screen now, you'll see that the book now is, is highlighted and underlined. If you do want to book onto, onto that seminar or if you want a bit more information, then you can use that link to, to go and have a look at more. And we've also got a compliance update day. Now that's coming up in London just towards the end of November. And again, you can use the book now um, sort of link on the screen to take you through to the website where you can have more information um, and book if you want to. And you can watch all of our previous webinars. So if you've missed any, then please pop onto the website. Um, so it's codeuk.com forward slash webinars where you can take a look at our previous webinars.